He made his on-screen debut with Elton John. He took on James Bond and John McClane and still lived to see a few more Impossible Missions. An iconic actor with over three decades of experience behind him, Andreas Wasnowski, thank you very much for joining us today. My pleasure indeed. I've seen you, I see you've, you've done your, your research. You even dug up the uh, Elton John video. <laughs> <laughs> it, was a, it was a great shot. Good song too, I'd never heard it before. Hey. This is the iconic Andreas. Why wouldn't he be involved with Elton John? Now, I want to ask you something. Uh, I'm just going to jump right into this because as a child that loved Die Hard and uh, before I, the IMDb's of the world, I wanted to find out about my favorite characters who I'd seen a hundred times. So when I meet them, they would see just how weird I was. Now, one thing I found out was that your career as a performer began with you dancing, something you credit your mother for taking you to the ballet as a child. How long were you a dancer before the transition into acting actually started? Well, I was a pro for five years, and uh, it it was a kind of a it was a kind of a smooth transition, because uh, what happened was I was I was uh, working in a dance company, and um, we did some work with a choreographer who did what we call total theatre. That means you, you use your body, but you use everything else as well. And it's, it was quite physically demanding, but but for me the, the 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 breakthrough was that I could use my whole being rather than you know just just my body and and being silent on a on a on a stage. It just didn't. It's, just, it's very it's a very artificial thing in a way, um, and it seemed um, you know a step towards some more natural way of expressing myself, and and uh, I loved that. And soon after that, uh, an, op an opportunity came along where I could do a student film. And then that was my first um, on-screen experience as an, as an actor. In the course of that, I learned that, uh, you know, I lack some skills and uh, I had to then do something about those. But, but uh, while, while all this happened, I was still, I was still dancing, but um, not for much longer that kind of uh, sealed it for me. I know like you went, you transitioned from dance into acting was when you got into dancing, was that ever something that you were, that you went into planning to make like a long go of and then acting came and took its place or how did that transition happen? You know, I'm looking at this with, uh, with the, um, the benefit of a long distance perspective. You know, I'm, I'm I'm really not a natural dancer, and I'm also naturally a bit on the lazy side. So for me to become a dancer was always a bit of a stretch. Um, it I did it because I saw it as a way of getting some attention, I guess, and uh, being able to produce myself. And you know, seeing those people out there in front in the limelight, mm -hmm. and that that attracted me and I just couldn't see any other way of getting there. Um, yeah. So it was more of, you know, it was, it was more of like a, just a desire to perform in general, it seems like, or, yes. or to have an audience. Yes. Yes. Very much so. I mean, these days I think, boy, I wish I'd been a musician. <laughs> <laughs> What's, uh, I guess, because they get, they get a lot more attention always front state, front and center on the stage. Is that what that's about? Well, I'm, you know, there, there are several, there are several aspects to it, but I, I love, I love music. And, um, I actually, I started playing the cello when I was about 50. And I'm terrible at it, but but what one of the things that attracts me to it is that I will never get to the bottom of it. It will always be there. Will always be more to be discovered, and so forth. And uh, that's just that's just great about about music. Mm -hmm. um, now, I'm not saying that the other the other arts don't don't have that depth, but but there are other limiting factors. I mean, dancing is over when you're 40, so. That's um, that's quite a restriction, and with acting, it's uh, you know the the parts that you can play um, contract <laughs> you know pretty soon uh, um, at at uh, sixty or or seventy. There's only a few. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Unless you're doing the Irishman. 
And they're using those de-aging <laughs> techniques with Robert De Niro and Al Pacino. Now, I, one thing I want to segue on, you spoke of d- just diving into something. One of the things that you dove into was your first acting work took place on stage. And you didn't really have any formal education into it. And as you spoke to, it was more so of a performance art of just using your body and not being able to use your voice. How was theater community where you were at the time as far as their perception of actors without traditional training? How did they treat you? And, and more and more in depth to that is there were professionally trained actors there. Was it any type of contrast any, or were they more so helpful in what you had to bring to the table? Well, um, interesting. The um, These productions, there were, there were a couple or three, actually required a great uh, degree of, uh, of physical ability and stamina. It was, it was very, very hard work. And so this man I, I did this with, Habitually used act uh, used uh, sorry used dancers because because uh, someone who wasn't extremely fit wouldn't just wouldn't have gone wouldn't have been able to make it it was mm-hmm. it was that sort of thing so I was in the same position as everybody else they were all dancers that had to extend themselves rather than being being well schooled for for uh, you know the task of acting uh, so there was I wasn't I wasn't sticking out in any way at that point but. Um, I did notice that uh, you know I had to do a lot of shouting and stuff, and uh, I had I didn't have any technique. I didn't know what to do with my voice, and I lost it pretty quickly, and mm-hmm. got hoarse. And I decided, uh, you know, I have to inquire to have to acquire some some techniques. Um, on the whole, depending on where you are and what you do, there are always a few people that um, that enter the field, you know, in a non traditional way. And it, it obviously matters much more on stage than than it does on screen, but um, I've never encountered animosity for that. Nice, yeah. That uh, sounds like the perfect transition to to be a part of a production like that, where you're surrounded by you're you're doing theater, but you're surrounded by other dancers. That's like perfect. You mentioned in another interview, and as of. <laughs> Right. Uh, and actually, in the last answer um, about your voice being the greatest challenge um, as far as acting went. Um, and I can only imagine like the how it would go hoarse, like doing the performances every night. And if you're having to scream, if you're I, I don't even know what the correct way is not to. But if you're not doing it that way, I can see how that would be an issue um, if you don't have your voice by the end of the week. Other than that, though, you felt. Uh, you felt confident in your abilities. I, I watched the interview that you did with, um, uh, I'm spacing on his name right now, but it was, uh, um, yeah, I think he was a teenager, 13, 14, maybe. Oh, yeah. Uh, it was a, yeah. The, the British, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a great interview. And um, I, I was I was really impressed. My wife's watching it. I was like, why does that kid sound like he's 35 years old? <laughs> he's just, he's really good. Yeah, he's he was got quite it. right, wasn't he? Yeah, nice. Yeah. Um, but as far as like the uh, having that confidence in yourself, can you expand on that a little bit as far as um, as far as what you meant and with your and with your voice? Like when you when you took training for that, like what course of action did that involve to um, to get your voice to a place where you could scream every night? Let me let me answer that that bit first. Um, <coughs> I, I simply. Um, I simply found um, an actress, uh, an acquaintance of someone else, and and asked her to to work with me. And it's actually quite it's actually quite a simple thing. We just have to um, to practice a little bit. What we tend to do, we tend to to put some tension into into the throat and and squeeze, and that makes the vocal cords so after a while. And all you have to do is to to learn to. To breathe from your from your deep belly and just let the let the air stream past it in an unobstructed way and then that's it. Um, Use that diaphragm. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> Diaphragmatic breathing and you you know you kind of, you need a sort of certain placement to to allow for allow for that to happen. Um, that wasn't that wasn't difficult for me because one of the things that you do acquire when you, when you study ballet is that you are uh, you you train your kinesthetic sense so you are very aware of what it is you're doing and that has 
that's come in um, handy quite a few times, you know, when, when I was doing some stunts and fights and things like that. Um, there was more to the first part of the question, wasn't there? I've forgotten it now. Sorry. <laughs> no, that's okay. I kind of I kind of looped around quite a bit on that one, uh, trying to find my way back. One thing the, I was interested in asking him was, uh, like you say, you started, you came in primarily being a dancer, and then now you went into the acting. But let's say f fast forward a few years. Let me ask you this. Has anything changed in your approach to acting now? Because you mentioned you learned with the voice technique, and I'm pretty sure you picked up other techniques along the way. Has anything else changed to, as far as your acting approach throughout the years? Have you become more seasoned? I would hope so. <laughs> um, what? Why I decided I um, didn't go need to go to acting school. There were there were two aspects. First of all, I was uh, arrogant and uh, thought I. And, and you and you mentioned being lazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And um, there, I mean, there's there there are several aspects to to being on stage, and one of is of course that you cannot. You cannot allow your inhibitions to to show, but <clears throat> excuse me, but that is something I I was already familiar with, right? I was I've done I've been on stage for for three or four years, and in fact, um, I started um, performing when I was about nine, you know, kiddie ballet and uh, and that sort of stuff. Um, so so stage was uh, was not frightening to me it was you know that's why i got my attention that's why i, I like to be and uh, so it, it's a kind of a freeing experience and um, if you if you can see it that way and then of course when you do more demanding acting work you kind of need to know what effect it has what you're doing so there's a there's quite a difference as to where you're, whether you're performing for 2,000 people in a theater or whether you're in a huge close-up. If, yeah. if, you, if you do the, the, if you use the right measure of, of the former for the latter, it just becomes ridiculous. But some of that, just you just have to, if, if you're not totally insensitive, some of that you'll just acquire because you notice pretty quickly what works and what doesn't. You know, you, you get feedback all the time. <laughs> Kind of yeah. not so kind. <laughs> I could imagine, yeah. You attribute much of your early success to a combination of luck and being in the right place at the right time. Your first three roles were working with the extraordinary director Ken Russell, rest in peace, on Elton John's music video Nikita in 1985, and then the feature film Gothic in 1986, followed by a segment uh, that Ken directed in an anthology film called Aria in 1987. Um, how did you and Ken initially meet that resulted in your part in the Nikita video and what led to working together the following years? It was a party. He, he picked me up and he talked to me at a party. That's, that's what I mean by being in the right place at the right time. Um, luck. luck. Um, for some reason, he thought I was right for what he was looking for precisely then. And, and, uh, and that was it. So the, this party, this was your first time meeting and you guys hit it off and yeah. next thing you know, you're in and out. That's, that's amazing. It's not what you know, it's who you know, man. Yeah. <laughs> now, long, long story short. Hey, man, but I like it though. I like it. Now, I want to ask you this. Now, filming your first big role as Necros in the Bond film, The Living Daylights, began in late 1986. Now, and it concluded in early 1987. Necros gave you the opportunity to impersonate quite a few different characters with various accents along the way. What was the experience like? Um, and was there a particular dialect that uh, proved to be a little bit more challenging than others? Well, certainly, I think, uh, in, I mean, I, you know, I thought I could hack it, but they, they actually, um, they actually dubbed, dubbed the voice, dubbed my voice. Yeah, I, I, I did, I did try, but, um, you know, wasn't good enough. Uh, Cockney was especially difficult. I could imagine that's isn't that like uh, what what Brad Pitt did and um, uh, Snatch. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. That I, I could imagine that would be challenging. Mm -hmm. um, you've said previously that you landed the role because uh, they pretty much wrote a character that happened to describe you perfectly. Um, what similarities stood out to you the most um, between you and the character, and how did you set out to convey to uh, to casting that this role was unknowingly made? Uh, for you? 
Well, the 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 physicality, of course. You know, I mean, um, my my body and and uh, being in good shape and what I what I could do and had to do. I don't know that there was anything in particular. I mean, p- perhaps there was. I don't really recall. I mean, don't forget that I was definitely not very skilled at auditioning at the time. So I probably went in there all blue eyed. You know, it just. Um, I'd imagine there had to be something because you couldn't have been the only over six foot uh, model esque looking European like like I I, I I'm not, I I'll accept the fact that you don't know, but I have to believe there was something more than just the physicality. <laughs> well, I, I mean, from a lot of the guests that we've interviewed, and that you may be able to speak to this, is that they've all said this: no matter how talented you may be, sometimes the director or the casting director is just looking for that specific look, and they don't know it until they see it. Yeah, I mean, it, I, I, if I recall, they, you know, they, they just described, they just described me. It's a, a tall guy, uh, blonde with slick back hair, and and there I walked in, and you know, I was cute in those days. <laughs> That, that that would have been it, it would have been a real bad blow if you didn't get the part like it, going into it thinking like okay i mean this is describing me all i pretty much have to do is is not totally suck because it's i'm right here on the page already <laughs> now it goes both ways you know i've had parts written for me and and being described and then some some small guy with an ethnic background got the part. You just don't know. <laughs> yeah. Now, yeah. Now, he mentioned his flowing blonde hair, but I know once, because I had a question about it, but I'm glad he brought it up because it's a great segue, is that there was one time where you didn't have flowing blonde hair. And let's talk a little bit about Die Hard and your role of Tony Vresky. The fire has been called off, my friend. And if I mess it up, let me know. But I'm going to go with Tony Vresky, uh, culminating in one of the most iconic moment in action cinema history. So there was one question that was on here that I'm supposed to go into, but I have to know since you brought up the hair. Did you have to do anything to your hair or how did you feel about the look they gave you? You were like the smartest, buffest, dancing nerd, badass I ever seen in my life. Like, well, what was that look based on? I don't know. I don't I don't uh, I don't recall anything in particular. Um, the only thing I remember is that those. Um, Jeffrey Dahmer glasses. Tony has scared the hell out of me since I was five years old with his stone cold demeanor and those Jeffrey Dahmer glasses. I don't think I can do this. Um, <laughs> they they were actually mine. I, I wore them. I wore them. <laughs> so they were your glasses. They weren't Jeffrey's. They were yours. <laughs> uh, they were mine. And they they made a couple of they made a couple of copies. Now they, that, that's good. Uh, I guess that's good. <laughs> Sufficiently psychopathic or something. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> okay, let me ask you this: What was the audition process like for Die Hard? I'm sorry, I have oh, to no, go. Say, please, please. I, Jeffrey Dahmer. I thought go. that I was. <laughs> I thought that I was throwing a light jab at the fictional character. I had no idea when I wrote that that those were your personal glasses. I do apologize. <laughs> oh my god! I, I stand, I stand don't, by. Don't it, apologize. But... <laughs> I, don't, I don't get insulted. <laughs> all right so i think a lot of fans may want to know this uh they want uh what was the audition pro- process like for die hard and was there any hesitancy on your part uh, to actually take the role and any fear of being just stereotypical like typecast as just the bad guy <laughs> that's, that's quite funny actually look i'm in hollywood this is the first this is the first shot i get and i'm gonna think about whether you want to take the part <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. Um, it was actually it was it was an easy audition. I mean, there was there was only just a few lines, and I think, quite frankly, I got that part because I looked like Alexander Goodenough, and we were supposed to be brothers. That was that. Nice. Now, was he a dancer too, or did I read that wrong? No, he was. He was, and we had actually met dancing years prior. Wow. And yeah, funny. Then we ended up playing um, brothers and and, and Die Hard. Nine, 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 nine. So you hear that, kids? If you want to be an actor, just dance, work out, and you'll be fine. Forget the acting, just dance and work out. That's all you got to do. Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, you have a pretty intense fight scene with Bruce Willis. You guys are bus- uh, busting into plaster walls, through metal beams, down a flight of stairs. And I'm, I'm sure there was, um, there was uh, some... Uh, stuntmen that that came into play there at some points but um for you what what kind of preparation went into that and um i'm wondering if the uh 
your training in dance early on uh, was valuable in memorizing that choreography. Yes, that's it, it totally. It totally was. I mean, you, you just you just your awareness of of space and and uh, you know being able to repeat something precisely, which is a, quite a good skill to have for a camera. I don't recall any particular prep for it. Uh, it, it wasn't really uh, it wasn't really complicated enough. That fall down the, the staircase, I didn't, I didn't do myself. And actually, that was uh, that was tricky enough that it took a couple of stuntmen to be able to complete it. I recall one um, actually dislocating his shoulder. So you know, glad I didn't do that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, there is a uh, there's a particular line that represents either a cultural misunderstanding or maybe a sign of the times being so different with respect to the way law enforcement was universally accepted as good guys. Um, I, I found it funny you're, you're, when your character uh, taunts McLean you, saying, you know, you won't hurt me because you're a policeman. Because you're a policeman. There are rules for policemen. What was your motivation there as an actor? And um, did Tony actually believe that he was protected by some code that McLean was held to? Or did you see this as another lie, kind of like... I promise I won't hurt you. ...before firing off the machine gun? Well, you're really um, testing my, my memory now. I, <laughs> I don't have a bloody clue. <laughs> that's fair. That's that's fair. Quite a bit has happened between now and then. <laughs> I, I, in, in my heart of hearts, I wanted his character to believe that McLean that he was just lying to him, just to yeah, just like cute reasons of time. Like, yeah. yeah, you're a policeman. You have rules. I'm not gonna hurt. You. I mean, you say I'm not gonna hurt you, and two seconds later, you're firing off thirty rounds. Right. Yeah. <laughs> there, there is that. Right. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't. Yeah. Yeah. That's you know, it's it's a movie. I mean, you don't want it to be to be boring do you <laughs> right yeah yes uh, the whole thing is a brilliant cat and mouse game mm -hmm. now your character is the first care uh is the first terror uh, i'm sorry alleged terrorist who said we were terrorists to die at the hands of mclean and as we said it's such an iconic scene but what it also does it, it also sets off a series of events that ripple until the film's credits now when you first got the part were you aware of your significance of your character when you accepted the role or were you not let in on the light of it i, I didn't have a clue um also don't forget we we didn't know where this film was going, you know. I mean, mm -hmm. now we look at it as, as a, it's a classic, and it, it kind of established um, um, a subgenre of of uh, movies. Um, you know, yeah. we've had Die Hard on an airplane and Die Hard on a ship, and probably somewhere Die Hard in a toilet. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, today we just died hard on a podcast. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Yeah, no, yeah, that's it's it resurrected Liam Leeson's career. Liam Leeson's career resurrected his. I mean, I thought that was such a cool aspect of the film that your character brought that creating uh, because from McLean's side, he's he, he's trying to save his wife from Gruber. And then uh, when you come along, that creates this uh, personal vendetta. Uh, and that like a personal thing between Carl and McLean. So it's like this, it's not just a heist and a cop trying to stop a heist and a terrorist trying to outweigh a cop from that moment where mm. you show up in the elevator with, with the shirt, it's, it's become like the stakes are like increased uh, a lot in that moment and you could feel it. And it, right, I mean, it was just such a really, such a good scene. <laughs> Yeah, it's just nifty, isn't it? When when characters have dimension rather than being uh, cardboard cutouts, I think that was one of the that was one of the things that Die Hard did did really well. Yeah, for yeah, sure. I mean, good. every and everybody, uh, every character had their like Arc. was well rounded, all the way to um, uh, uh, Val Johnson mm -hmm. um, uh, and Carl. Al. Yeah, Al, 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 yes. That like he has he 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 gets to shoot somebody at the end and that's the arc for his character and uh but that's the fun thing about watching these films is is that like you mentioned with his character now you die you're the first terrorist to die but and that's what let's say 20 30 minutes into the film but almost an hour later Bruce, we still feel the weight of your character because carl is going crazy now he's over and she was like i know that look 
Only John can drive somebody that crazy. Your brother is going crazy over your death, so we still feel your weight an hour into the film. That's writing and that's character development. You guys pulled that off. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it was, it was, uh, it was nice. It wasn't uh, even that wasn't necessarily so obvious uh, from the beginning because mm -hmm. when we started, we started shooting a medium budget film with a certain script, but but it changed on a daily basis. You know, we had many, many, many rewrites. No. New pages every day. Is that was that difficult for you? Because I know you're you were a trained dancer, and clearly moves can change. But now you're talking about moving parts of a film changing. Was that difficult, or because you weren't so, or is this one of those times for not being so much trained in acting, you just going with the flow and it doesn't bother you? Yeah, I mean, certainly the latter. Um, don't also don't forget, you know, I had uh, almost no dialogue in it, and so I wasn't um, I wasn't uh, tested in that way. Very good. I like that. Now you you did get uh, rest in peace and to one of the most iconic Mount Rush. He's well, um, not maybe not my Mount Rushmore, but he's in my Congress of acting. Uh, you got to work with the great late great Alan Rickman. This was his first role in a feature film. What was it like? And do you have any memories that you can or would like to share with us regarding your time with him? Well, um, if you're looking for a cute anecdote or something, I I don't recall anything in particular, but. Um, Alan became Alan became a friend. We were we we remained friends until uh, he died about uh, three years ago, and not that we saw all that much of of each other because you know uh, he was uh, traveling, shooting here and there. But um, I learned I learned a lot from him right right there and then. I mean, I was still on the on the steep learning curve, and uh, I thought it was uh, thought it was amazing how he. How he managed to be flexible and do what was required, and you know there are certain requirements for for a big American action film, and still remained remained true to you know certain things about about his himself as far as as far as doing it, um, some sort of sincerity, you know that was that was uh, one of the things I I most admired about him. He was. He was fully behind what he did, and um, found ways of of compromising that that didn't um, that that nobody perceived as you know as um, something missing. You know, I mean, like one of the I I, I can uh, I can say this much: he he didn't like portraying violence without. Finding some valve that made it less serious, because he thought, well, you know, a lot of kids, a lot of kids are going to see this, and uh, he didn't want it to to portray just as, you know, some sort of destructive action, you know, and, and so he always wanted to imbue it, and I think succeeded really well with it, with with some sort of humor. That yeah. speaks to what I actually read. I read that the director had to actually cut away from a lot of the shots of him using a gun because he would flinch every time he used it. And that well, muscle they were using real. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, that too. But at the same time, to speak to what he said, that he wasn't really about violence unless it made sense. Let's not just fire our guns just to fire. And if you notice it outside of Takashi, Takati, who, who does he really kill? That's a good point. I mean, yeah. hey, um, that. Uh, well, that, I mean, that uh, asshole I mean, Ellis. Yeah, well, we'll talk about that later. But yes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the um, uh, with I wanted to ask with Alan Rickman. With the uh, of course, there's that um, there's the classic story about where he's dropped from the building and how the stunt coordinator told the guy to do it on on three instead of one, so he would really catch him off guard and catch a natural reaction. Um, did you have or were you on set? around that time or did he ever uh bring that up in the, after the fact nope i first time first time i i heard and saw anything about it was the was the premiere there was a crew screening at uh, 20th century fox um most most of it actually I, I wasn't around very much at all i mean they um i i tell the story like this they they hired me for seven weeks i was on the set 10 days Three or four out of those, I did nothing, and um, of the remaining few days, I was dead for three. <laughs> so, so you know, it was it was really it was a tiny part. So, 
you know, my my perspective is uh, clearly limited on it. Yeah. That's- I mean, I'm just, I'm, I just got to ask. I mean, like you just said, I, I know the answer from what you've told us, but like you said, it was a tiny part. And that's just a beautiful part to me about art is that what one may perceive as something so small can just be immortalized. Like so many people have researched you out of all the great things you've done. People look at that and you're only on set for a little bit. But to this day, people quote and clearly get satire made out of things that you your death was. up. I mean, they they they, they immortalize his, they They revel his death more than his life. And that's what's crazy. Like you've created a piece of art that can never be taken away from this world. And that's amazing. Um, yeah, that is quite, that's quite a, a remarkable thing, isn't it? I mean, yes. it's, it's nice with you if you are, if you are a performer on stage, the, the moment the curtain falls, it's over. And this is a, this is a different thing. Yeah, I mean, I'm still, fi- I'm still finding out things. You know, that, that doll you, you sent me a picture of, I, I, uh, I didn't know until some sometime last year that that someone done that. I didn't even know the last name of Tony. Uh, that <laughs> oh was, my that god! Was, that was not in the script. And you see that there are people out there that know more about it than than do I. <laughs> that's yeah. I mean that that's got to be kind of mind blowing to uh, to have a a toy uh, of your likeness uh, and be you're not just immortalized in the film, but you're immortalized in these figurines that'll be sit, that sitting up on people's shelves and passed down to their kids. and Although they didn't do him any favors. We must know. We got to sell it right now. Or do you really wear like a size eight? Why did they, me- what was that feet thing about? Please tell me that you could really not fit those shoes. I could really not fit those shoes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's it. That's an obstu- observation right there. Thank you. Man. <laughs> yeah. no, I, I mean, mine not mine not twelve. I don't. I don't right. really know how that. Bruce wishes. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that would have been a funny side if he was running around in twelves trying to. That would have been harder than doing barefoot. <laughs> It would have would have given it a completely different take, don't you think? Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> like clown shoes. Um. The uh, is there? Uh, I know you said that you know you were um, you were there for a limited amount of time. Um, but before we moved on, I just wanted to ask if there is any particular memory from this from the uh, production that uh, that we haven't covered that you'd like to share. There are. I just don't know how how interested you are in uh, in the food they were serving. Um, I just I remember that we were being treated very well. That's that's something that I can say about American production as compared to uh, everybody else's. Um, I've always been treated um, extremely well, and um, that you know you you may think it doesn't really matter all that much for the the outcome of the film, but. It certainly mattered for my well-being. <laughs> so as the character who has Ho 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 plastered across his shirt, do you consider Die Hard to be a Christmas film or no? Yes. Okay. Thank you. That settles it. I don't hear anybody else. <laughs> yeah, as he said it, and, that, and, and there you go. Now, with, with that being said, thank you so much for that. Um, I want to ask you something about this. We always love when uh, we've been doing this show for about three seasons now. We um, have guests on from time to time. And one of our most genuine beloved guests was Mr. Barry Corbin. You may know the name from all the iconic things he's done. And of course, he was in Northern Exposure, which in 1992, you starred as Arthur in an episode of Northern Exposure. Um, we were curious. What was your experience like on that set? Oh, it was uh, it was great. It was really it was really wonderful because. Um, I think at the time it was one of the the top television shows, and they just took they just took such care to to do it right, to to get everything just right, and it was just it was really um, it was really luxurious work. Bizarrely, I had to audition for it three times. You know, I mean, I went for, I went in for Die Hard once, but but to to play the the bear guy, I had to I had to read three times. It's like payback for getting a, a Elton John music video off of just attending a party. You paid for it later on. <laughs> Back to one. Yeah. 
1994, you played Waylon in Death Machine, which won an award for Best Special Effects at Fana Festival and was also nominated for Best Film at Fana Sporto International Fantasy Film Festival. Uh, it's a very intriguing concept. It seems kind of like a love letter to the horror sci-fi genre. It has callbacks to Nightmare on Elm Street, Alien, and even a character named Sam, uh, Sam Raimi, uh, John Carpenter, and Scott Ridley. Um, can you tell us a little bit, a little bit about that project? Because I haven't seen it, but it, it just it sounds out like just crazy. I, I didn't know it had won. It had won all those awards. That's that's great. I think um, Steve Norrington was a real um, aficionado. You know, he 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 just put he put everything into this. I mean, I remember, you know, I remember him pulling cables on the set, you know, whatever it took to, to get that film, to get that film done the way he envisioned it. And, um, I've so, some people call it, um, the best low budget film, um, ever. I, I really, I had, I, I really enjoyed it. I mean, it, um, with these at, at, at least at, at the time, you know, smaller budget films didn't, didn't have that exposure. I don't actually recall whether that ever got any release. But it was uh, it was um, enjoyable work. Also, there you know there were some some excellent people in it. I mean, I, I really uh, appreciated uh, Brad Dourif and and meeting him and stuff. Yeah, great great actor. Now the year is 1996. You star in the very first Mission Impossible, and I'm just going to go ahead and tell you, I'm a fan of conspiracy theories, and yeah, you may have heard this one, but we're going to jump into it now. You return to the franchise 15 years later in 2011's Mission Impossible: Ghost Protocol. Now you're first credited as Max Companion, and then as Fox Contact. Now, your return to spark some fan theories out there, some wild, some not so wild, that you're the same character, but working for different employers. So noticing things like the way you smile at Hunt or brandishing a bag for his head in a gesture, seemingly mirroring your first meeting, promoting other theories that Max was a part of the plan or network that Fog belonged to now. Regarding any NDAs, throw them out the window. Are you in any position to confirm or deny or stoke the flames of those theories? Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm not going to tell you more. <laughs> okay. um, the beat was everything. Yes. It's Yeah, that, that was obviously some stuff going on behind the scenes. Um, that was Max was going to be in it. And then, you know, I, I had, I, I was, um, I was booked for two scenes, one in, in Dubai, the one that, that's in the film, and one in Canada sometime in the future. And Max was going to be there, played by by uh, Vanessa Redgrave again. And then they scrapped it. Mm. So up to you now. <laughs> I didn't know I didn't even know this thing about Pog's contact. I <laughs> I I was as far as I'm concerned, I was Max's companion all along. <laughs> <laughs> so there we go there's a little weight to that water there i like that i like that now let me ask you this uh and speak on it just as if you can't hear now you stand at nearly an entire foot taller than tom cruise now what is it like to tower over someone physically but whose persona is so larger than life with regarding his resume and things of that nature well you know some things even out don't they that's that's a po- that's a very poetic approach to that answer. I love that. I think yeah. I like that. I love yeah. that. Yes, they do. <laughs> um, yeah, it's quite funny because I, I think we I think we also have the same birthday. I had a, I had a good conversation with uh, with Tom on the um, on that half day that I spent shooting in in Dubai. It's nice. We were, we were talking about our kids and sports and whatnot. I, I I I mean I know he was he was smaller than me, but I don't recall it mattering. So I, I don't think I wasn't thinking. I wasn't feel like I was towering over him. Uh, maybe that is because he is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hey, this is Tom. Hi, Tom. <laughs> but he was down there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, in 2001, you directed a short film called Willows. Uh, can you tell us about that project? What made you want to direct? And um, especially knowing now how you, how you mentioned that you have a, uh, you're prone to laziness. 
uh, I feel like directing is not the task for someone that <laughs> doesn't like to <laughs> take on things. Um, but what, but what was that experience like being your first time directing? Okay, well, a um, couple of things. May may I use may I use this opportunity to to set the record straight on a few things? Sure. I, I never directed any film called Willows. I was I not in Strikes Again. <laughs> I was not in Surviving Picasso with Anthony Hopkins, although I was up for it. And I don't live with a Brazilian supermodel either. <laughs> I wanted that last one to be true. <laughs> I tell you, uh, IMDb lets us down at least thirty-five percent of the time. <laughs> um, I have to, I have directed some some shorts. I am very attracted to directing, um, though you are of course right. It's um, it's not really um, conducive to lazy people to to direct. I think uh, it was Michael Winner who once said the hardest thing about directing is not sleeping for three months. Um, but that's okay. I, I mean, I can I can live with it when it's when it's worth it. And uh, I mean, I um, you know there was a time that I have worked very hard, and it's all it's all a matter of what is it for and is it is it worth it and some things are certainly worth it what uh, what i like about directing is to to be at the hub of a bunch of talented people and you know having a vision and taking all this talent and and channeling it, channeling it into something that you've kind of envisioned um i think about i think about filmmaking like this when you have a dream in other words, when you see something in your head and you want to share that with others, you have to go through all the steps. You have to write it into a script, and then you have to get the people together to make it happen. You have to find the funds to do it. You have to film it, and so forth and so forth and so forth, through all the many steps. And when it's ready, you can share your dream. And that is a fantastic process. Yeah, I agree. That's a that's a perfect way to put it too. And and when something when you're uh, so compelled by something that you're motivated beyond like natural human endurance, uh, I, I'm I'm lazy as hell when it comes to getting those dishes done. But I will go three days without sleeping on a film production. Uh, and not even really feel the fatigue until the moment it's wrapped. And then my body is like, what the hell did you do to me? <laughs> you know, it, that's. I think when you're responsible for other people, not just yourself, that's when it's like, okay, this is a, not a selfless act anymore. I got to do this for other people. Their lives are in my hands. So while the internal, you may be like, I don't want to do this shit. Once you bring everybody else on, like you say, for that dream to release to everyone, I can completely understand that. Now, if we fast forward a little bit to 2008, you were the, if I'm not mistaken, the Tarman in the suspense horror hush. What was uh, that experience like port portraying such a thickly veiled antagonist? I met the, um, the director and I, and it was, it was his first script and, and film, and I really liked him, and I wanted to help him make his film. It certainly wasn't the pay. <laughs> it wasn't putting me up in a student's, uh, in a student's home in Sheffield. <laughs> mm. yes. oh my goodness now speaking of pay now but yeah yeah because, because I, I asked yes thank you the prop was probably worth more than that's salary. what i was going to ask now speaking of pay did you know that the feathered resin chicken foot used by your character is available for purchase for 500 pounds did you know that hang on uh oh he has it here we go <laughs> he's the seller <laughs> <laughs> Get my Brad Pitt on. <laughs> Bro, without reading. <laughs> this is a real chicken foot. The that other one is a fake. <laughs> I don't know. It I might be a fake. They might, they might have had a copy of it, but but this is the real chicken foot. And I'm, I'll be happy to sell it for five. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was gonna say. I would have I would have fell out of my seat if you would have said like 
I'm actually the one that posted that on eBay. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. But if somebody did buy that fake one though. I'm still trying to get paid on that movie. <laughs> oh my God. That is great. Man. That is so good. Um, in 2011, you played a neo-Nazi in a horror film called The Depraved. Um, as someone who was born in West Germany just 14 years prior to the end of uh, World War II, um, what was it like for you to portray someone who um, idolizes the sentiments of the Nazi party? Well, I can um, answer this on, on several levels. I have to admit I didn't uh, dive that deeply into, into this part, um, perhaps partially because uh, I was only on the set for three hours or so. Um, that, it, that was, that was the, the extent of it. On the other hand, you know, it is one of the, the attractions of being an actor that you can also delve in and, and perhaps um, feel out what it's like to, to harbor convictions and attitudes that you, you would never, um, that you'd never acquire or, or share in your, in your real life. Um, I, I have I have pl I've played a Nazi a couple of times, and um, you know, in order to do it convincingly, you have to kind of make yourself believe that there's something to it. And you know, the process I think the process works mainly by by ignoring by ignoring things. You know, I mean, I can I can be a supremacist by you know, by ignoring a whole bunch of uh, things, you know, the fact that the average IQ of everybody is the same. White people don't have higher IQ than others and they don't um, run faster and they, you know, they don't make better music, none of that. So, but, but, but people function like that by, by ignoring aspects of reality. And uh, is that human? Um, yeah, it's human, you know. I mean, not all human things are uh, great, you know. The, <laughs> and and with that, it's with it with a narrow-minded seeing seeing only a small part of it. A great deal of damage has been done through probably you know forever, but for but for as long as there are humans on this earth, and um, I suspect it's going to continue. That doesn't mean, though, that it's not, you know, I mean, in a way, in a way, playing a part like this gives you some sort of compassion and understanding for people that you wouldn't ordinarily sympathize with because because they, you know, they have some warped or, or sick or distorted or ignorant attitude mm -hmm. um, that in, in no way is that, in, is that uh, you know, uh, agreeing. Yeah. You know, one of the one of the things that that are extraordinary about human beings is we can, we can, without compromising what we do, we can pretend that another reality exists. We call that imagination. Or I, I, I like to to I like to call it what if. We can play what if and feel out some scenarios that we would never want to consider to to become reality or to to make reality of yeah and uh, that's that's an extraordinary thing and and look at what it's done i mean it's basically it's created uh, all the arts all the all creative um, all creativity comes comes from that yeah acting really is a safe space to it's almost like fire drills to uh it gives you like that opportunity to explore those places that you definitely wouldn't want to uh, uh it, it, yeah it just kind of it, it lets you it might we all have demons and acting gives you the opportunity to exercise them in different ways without uh, real world consequences it may be the last form of art uh that you can do it and it used to be comedy but we see what happened with that um wait, now i will i want to ask you this here your latest released film is uh instrument of war which won the golden eagle at the golden eagle film and video competition as well as the audience choice award at the sedona international film festival now you play a character named call herman just like your brother, Carl, they call, no, no pun intended, Carl Herman. And the story is inspired by real events. Can you tell us a little bit about the project and the character you portray? 
Yeah, that happened. We we shot it in uh, in Lithuania, and that was um, altogether a really pleasant uh, experience. Uh, it was a, a Utah production company, you know, a, a low budget film shot in Eastern Europe. And although I had read the script and I thought that was uh, excellent, you know, the, the 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 circumstances were not such that that one's expectations are are typically high and in uh, in in uh, those circumstances but it was great it was great they had they had really they assembled some some very capable people and it was great fun i really i i was just uh, i'd hoped to to work with those guys again but it hasn't happened since they they yeah it was, it was, they were they were really they were really excellent they even um they even provided uh, research for 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 characters which i'd never i'd never come across in in any production and um so, so like with the script you, you kind of got like uh, uh supplemental information to let you know like what your motivation was and just, that's that's yeah that's well, awesome. well not not less less uh, less like this is what you should do but maybe you know this is something to educate you and the, the, the adam the director was uh he wasn't here you know thumbs thumbs on he kind of um let us roll with it, but but provided um, fertile, you know, f- fertile uh, information. So that was really great. I mean, I had not known about these uh, these camps, and extraordinary things sometimes sometimes happened. You know, I mean, there were there was there was a uh, a commander of one of these uh, Stalags who who used to go and play cards with the prisoners. I mean. You don't you don't usually hear that, right? That so they had dug up some some info on that, and it was it was fascinating because um, who knows whether I'd found it myself, but um, you know these things allow you to to uh, give a character some some dimension. Mm-hmm. And what a nice story it was! I mean, how what a what a non cliche Second World War movie. I don't know whether you saw it, but it, it was just sort of just not what you would expect, and it was um, really nice. I want to see it now. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, yeah, the way you've described, definitely want to have to check that out. Uh, to date, is there a particular role that stands out for you as as the most rewarding to bring to life? Not any particular one. I I dream of Leah, but um, but you know mm. who knows? Maybe I'm not capable of doing that and never get a chance i have to admit i don't um, i don't have any ambition in terms of pursuing pursuing um, acting i mean if something comes along i uh, i'm happy to to do it if if i like it my uh, my own plans go more towards uh, making my own stuff nice amazing um when uh when you get a, a new script for a character, and this this might be if you refer to like, you know, past tense experience, um, like you, you get a new script, you're looking at the character you'll be playing. What is your uh, process as far as fleshing that character out and making it your own? Well, that's something that, that has changed. You know, I used to um, sort of try and dive into the psychology of, of uh of characters, I I don't need to do that anymore. I just I have a process, and this has something to do with with my private life. I'm a I'm a Zen monk, and uh, there is a way of of entering an entity, a character, or you know, or even a facet completely. Where it's it's we call it you know dropping your ego, and when you do that, then certain things become become obvious so i can i can just take what's on the page and identify with it it's it's not an intellectual process it's you, you might call it a mystic mystical you 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 just entered you become one with it you you breach the gap between you and it and then all these things are kind of obvious and apparent and you just have to allow them to to play. So it's not really something that I want to take credit for. It's more like you become the instrument of the writer or the director and let it come to life without 
putting your own ideas on top. Yeah, I think we were just talking about that. Let, yeah. me, let me ask you this for any any aspiring act, actors or actresses out there. Is there any piece of advice you can give them from your experiences in the in the, in the industry? Yes. Don't do it. <laughs> That's what I tell my daughter. Let me qualify it a little bit. Um, if you do it, have a plan B. Um, I, I researched this once when I was living in Hollywood. At the time, there were 100,000 members of, uh, of SAG, the, um, the union. And, that, and I know there were more actors that weren't in SAG. So we're talking... The, the middle, a sort of a middle-sized city full of actors. How many actors do you recall from the last 10 years that you've seen or can even recognize? Hundreds, maybe a thousand. That means for every thousand, for, for every actor, there's a thousand or two thousand that never get to do any of it. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's an uphill struggle. And it, that's why I keep saying it requires luck. That doesn't mean that that are these people that are not working are not talented. It doesn't mean that at all. I've I've seen brilliantly talented talented people that just never managed to get a job for whatever reason. I mean, partially some people just can't audition. It doesn't mean they can't act. The auditioning is a different process. No matter how much you love it, no matter how good you are, you might not have a career. So that's why definitely have a plan B. Um, you know, just for some people, it's a matter of passion and they, and they can't help it. And I would never discourage anybody from following their hearts and what they do, but, you know, keep, keep a, a little opening for some practical aspects like mm -hmm. making a living. <laughs> yeah, that has got to be probably the most, the most practical realistic answer that we've got to that question i i, I love that because mm -hmm. that's that's the, the truth yeah i mean it, it really uh, to uh, to not make it does not mean that you're not talented that's like right. th that's the perfect way to put it because there are so many um unrecognized un you know undiscovered talent out there and to speak to what he said you may be a hell of an actor but are you a hell of an auditioner yeah and that that's yeah <laughs> yeah because oh yeah well, you're right auditions are uh key are a whole different animal yeah like, almost worse than the film it's yeah. crazy are you working on anything currently or is there anything that you'd like to let the audience know about sure gladly i am uh, i'm working on a project that i've written with my middle son it's called it's uh it's like uh, i pitch it as um post-apocalyptic bunker drama. I, I conceived it in, in, the, in the COVID time. I thought, what can we do that can be shot now? And it's all about people in bunkers some, sometime in some dystopian future. And we've just shot the teaser. I'm in the middle of post-producing uh, post it uh, with the idea to find someone who, who's going to give us a green light and make it happen. It, we're talking about a um, television series of short 30 minute episodes. That seems that's intriguing. Awesome. Yeah. And that's gotta be a really, is this, is this the um, first time that uh, you and your son have uh, collaborated on something together? Yes. I've tried, I've tried with the others, but they, they, they tend to be quite uh, uh, reticent towards that. This is, this is my middle one. And uh, it was, it was, it was really, it was one of the things that I, I, I dreamt of doing, doing, uh, really cool. doing something with my children and now that that he's done it, and he's also been he's in it. He's he wants to be an actor. Um, his back his backup is music. Oh boy! Uh, <laughs> um, now, that, now, that, now that he's done it, maybe maybe my oldest one will also come on board, who's a who's a composer. Uh, but he doesn't want to write film music, and you know, might start. <laughs> He knows yeah. what he's doing there. So before we say goodbye, it, it doesn't even have to be about film. It could just be any words from your heart. Is there any parting words you would like to leave with the audience or of the world that we live in nowadays? Be kind. That's perfect. Um, it's that simple. It really is. Yeah. Andreas, uh, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today, for, uh, for being so awesome to jump on that intro with us on such short notice. Uh, uh, um, you're an absolute pleasure to talk to. I really appreciate you coming on. No, really, no sweat at all. It was it was fun. I I enjoyed myself, and I 
I wish you all the best with your ongoing project. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Take good Take care. care. Huh? You, you too. too. Have a great day. Night. Thank <laughs> you.